The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the Gospel according to St. John in the third chapter and the 19th verse, the 19th verse in the third chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Now it's obvious, isn't it, from the very beginning of this verse that uh, here our Lord is continuing a statement which he's already been making. And this is the condemnation. He's already been speaking about it. So I would start reading again from verse 16. Indeed, I ought to go further back, but let us start at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. I say this is again a part of this mighty and momentous statement which the Lord Jesus Christ was making, you remember, to this man Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, one of the great Pharisees, one of the religious teachers of the children of Israel. He's been making a long statement to him. At first he had to deal with the questions that were put by Nicodemus, but that as long since gone, Nicodemus has become silent. He is just listening. And our Lord is now putting his message and his case to him positively. He wants him to see who he is and why he has come into the world and what especially he has come to do in the world. So he has emphasized this great love of God and has been at pains to make Nicodemus see that he as the Messiah had not come to condemn mankind, had not come to condemn the Gentiles in particular. He had come to save. And yet he says, though I haven't come to condemn, my very coming is a judgment. Because he being the one and only way of salvation, what we do about him, our reaction to him, and our response to him, obviously and of necessity, determines our destiny. Now, he's been putting that plainly and clearly to Nicodemus. You see, John 3.16 isn't enough. Indeed, uh, left alone, it can almost be dangerous because we are liable to read our own wrong thoughts into it. So our Lord has gone on elaborating I haven't come to condemn, he says, but to save. And then he explains in that 18th verse how this happens. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And yet, he says, even that isn't enough. He must go forward and elaborate it, and tell us something further about it. And so he proceeds to do it here. And he says, and this is the judgment. This is the verdict. This in particular. Now then, what is he saying here? Well, he is saying two main things. He is demonstrating to Nicodemus that what he has just been saying about this judgment is perfectly fair. It's perfectly just. It's perfectly right. That's the first thing he says. And the second thing is, he is showing that moral state and condition in mankind, 
which makes his coming into the world a judgment rather than a source of salvation, and which makes the condemnation of the man who doesn't believe on him something which is quite inevitable. That is really the essential message of this verse. I must, as, as it were, he says to Nicodemus, I must explain to you now how this condemnation, this judgment I'm talking about, is something which is absolutely just. This is the verdict, this is the judgment that light has come into the world. And men, not all men, but many men, love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. He thereby, I say, justifies this judgment that is the inevitable result of his coming into the world, though he has not come specifically to judge the world. You noticed exactly the same point in that twelfth chapter of this gospel, which I read to you at the beginning. He says it all again, exactly the same thing. It is something that can never be said uh, too frequently. Now, this is uh, of interest to us, uh, not merely uh, as something academic and abstract, not merely that we may consider what our Lord said to Nicodemus and look back at something that happened nearly 2,000 years ago. I'm calling your attention to it because... What our Lord said then to Nicodemus, he is saying still tonight. He still divides men into the two groups. The most appalling and tragic fact in the world tonight is this, is that there are men and women who do not believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God. There are people who reject him. And they don't realize all this about this judgment. Now, I say this is of urgent importance for us. It is perhaps of particular interest to us. These Sundays which are leading up to Good Friday, when again we are reminded, uh, as we ought to be reminded constantly, but we are such slaves to calendars and to particular times and seasons, that we tend to think of these things in a particular way uh, when we come to Good Friday, and we remember how that tragic thing took place, how the world rejected its own Savior, how men put the Son of God to death and said, Away with him, crucify him. The question is, I say, why did they do it? Why do men still do it? What is the reason, the explanation, the cause of the fact that men thus turn their backs upon God's only begotten Son, who has come into their world not to condemn them, but to save them. Well, the answer is given in this particular verse that we are looking at together. Now, we see it all very clearly, don't we, in the case of the Jews, and especially in the case of a man like this man, Nicodemus. I've reminded you again that this man was a Pharisee. He was a religious man. He was one of the great religious teachers. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us this. As a Jew and as a Pharisee, he was looking forward to the coming into the world of God's Messiah. That was the great message of the Old Testament, which he used to teach to the people. They knew that. They read their prophets. And they knew that in those prophecies there was this promise that a great deliverer, a great Messiah was going to come. And the Jews were looking for that. They were waiting for it. They were expecting it. And yet you see what our Lord is saying to Nicodemus here is this. That though you and your fellow Jews claim that you're looking for the Messiah and are longing for his coming... Yet I, standing in front of you as the very Messiah, and you're doubtful, you don't see, you don't understand, and you don't believe. He knew that he was to be rejected by his own nation and by his own people. And here he puts the whole thing before Nicodemus at this particular point. That is this extraordinary contradiction. They're expecting the Messiah. When he comes, they reject him. 
There it is in the case of Nicodemus and the Jews long ago. But I say that it's exactly the same in the world this evening. And it is particularly the case with respect to large numbers of good, intelligent people. It is particularly true of them. Now, there are many such people in the world tonight. And they say, quite frankly and openly and honestly, that they're dissatisfied with themselves, they're dissatisfied with the condition of the world, they're troubled about the world, they're anxious about it and anxious about its future. They say the newspapers reveal it all to us. We hear the news and we see that there's something terribly and tragically wrong. And they're very concerned about this. And they say that they're looking for a solution. They're looking for an answer. They'd like to see mankind living in a state of peace and tranquility and of friendship. They'd like to see an end of wars and troubles and commotions. They'd like to see the whole family of mankind enjoying one another's society and living together and pulling together. That's, they say, they, the thing they want. That is their ideal for life in this world. And they say that this is their greatest interest, their greatest concern. Is there no way of deliverance, they say. And they claim that they're seeking it and looking for it. And yet, you see, the whole time... The very thing, the only thing that can do that for which they seek is standing in front of them, as it were. The whole thing is facing them. It's offering itself to them. And like Nicodemus and the Jews of old, they don't see him and they don't see it. They pass them by and they're rushing on after other things. This is this extraordinary contradiction that is to be found in mankind this evening exactly as it was in the days when our blessed Lord was here in the flesh. And the question we therefore must ask is this. Why does mankind behave in this foolish manner? What's the matter with the world? What's the matter with men? What is the matter especially with all intelligent people? Those who really are quite sincere when they say that they're troubled and concerned and worried and that they really are looking for a solution. Why do they reject him? Why do they reject this message? That's the question. Now I say the answer is given in this one verse. And you notice it gives it in some of the great and characteristic New Testament words and terms. Here are some of them. Light. Darkness. Evil. This is the condemnation, that the light is come or has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Here indeed are the great biblical words, aren't they? You see, the Bible is a book that tells us about life in this world. It's God's own analysis of men in this world and men in sin. And we can't begin to understand its message and its teaching unless we see the significance of these particular words that are all brought together in this one verse by our Lord himself. Light, darkness, evil. What is this? What is the matter with men? Why doesn't men believe the gospel? Well, now, let me put it in my own form. Let me put it in a modern way to you by putting it like this. The first cause of the trouble, according to our Lord, is that man doesn't know the truth about himself. The first explanation of men's rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation is that man is in this appalling condition of being ignorant about himself. He thinks he knows why he is rejecting the gospel. The fact of the matter is he doesn't. That's what our Lord is saying. Now let me put it like this, therefore. The Bible asserts from the very beginning that man is in a state of delusion. Man has been deluded. 
That's the key to the whole history of the human race. Man was made by God with a mind and an understanding. That is something that differentiates men from all the animals. He has got a power and an ability to understand, to think, and to reason, and to work things out. God endowed him with this. Ah, yes, you see, but alas, unfortunately, the devil came in and he led men astray. He deluded him. And according to this book, man has been deluded ever since. He has been blinded. He still has got a mind, yes, but he can't use it properly. There is this twist that has been put upon it. And to make the tragedy ten times infinitely worse, man is uh, most deluded of all, perhaps, about himself, about his behavior, about his activity, about his outlook, about everything that he does. Now, there is no question at all that that is the whole essence of the problem this evening. Here, you see, in the gospel is a view of men. Now, up against it is the other view of men, the world's view of men, the world's view of itself, and they're diametrically opposed. How is man deluded about himself? How is man deluded about his real rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel? Well, the first way is this. Man believes that this whole problem is primarily an intellectual problem. That's the first point at which he goes wrong. He believes that his troubles with regard to the belief of this gospel are all of them intellectual. Doesn't he put it like this? He puts all his emphasis on understanding. That is why man is always talking, modern man always talks to us about his intellectual difficulties. He says, no, I, I'm not a Christian. You know, he says, in many ways, I wish I could be a Christian. But, you know, I, I read your Bible and I listen to your sermons and I've got my intellectual difficulties, my intellectual problems. Now, isn't that the reason that is given by almost everybody? It's certainly the reason that is given by every intelligent person. I'm granting them full intelligence, but that is the reason that they give. They say, you see, I know something about science, and I've got particular bits of knowledge and information, and I've got a mind, and I can't accept a thing which I don't understand, and my reason must fit into the thing properly. All his difficulties, he tells us, are intellectual. I needn't waste your time over this. You've all, we've all been involved in arguments on this very matter, haven't we? And the arguments are always on the intellectual level and the intellectual plane. That seems to be, according to modern men, the essence of the difficulty. And he thinks of himself like this. He is a man who's got an open mind. And he comes to the Bible with an open mind. He's a scientist. He's got a scientific outlook. This is, of course, the scientific age. He says people 200 years ago, perhaps even 100 years ago, were not scientific. But now we are. We are all scientific and we think things out clearly and we are interested in facts. And we are no longer, of course, uh, as our forefathers were, liable to be carried away by our emotions and by our instincts. Uh, we, we, we are governed only by reason and by thought. And uh, we are so controlled and uh, detached and objective in our outlook. And therefore... We come to this with this open mind of ours, and uh, unfortunately we are not satisfied with the evidence. It's purely a matter of intellect. This is our Lord's answer to that. This is the condemnation. That light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Now let me try and reason it out with you. If this is an intellectual matter, well then let me meet you at your own, on your own level, and on your own case, and on your own point. Let me show you how this is altogether wrong, as our Lord indicates here. Here are some reasons without going any further. 
I say that this cannot be primarily an intellectual matter. Why? Well, for this reason. What is all this about? What is this about? What's the business of the Bible? What's it talking about? What's its message? What was the message of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know there's only one answer to that? There's only one answer that must always come in the first position, and it's this. It is all about man's relationship to God. You see, that's the business of the Bible. It's a book about God and man in his relationship to God and how men can know God. No, no, the first business of Christianity is not to express its opinion on war and peace and strikes and industry and a thousand and one other things. It's got its views. You know, even all Christians don't agree about that. There are Christians in all political parties. No, no, it isn't that. But there is one thing that is always first. Man under God. How to know God, the old problem of Job. How can a man by searching find out God? How can a man know God? How can a man be just with God? That's the question. Very well, if that is the question, I argue that it is quite monstrous and ridiculous to suggest that it's primarily an intellectual problem. Why? Well, for this good reason, that God, because he is God, is incomprehensible. If God were not incomprehensible, he'd be smaller than men. But you see, man doesn't realize that. That's where he goes astray. He says, I want to let my mind run the thing. I want to have an intellectual understanding. You see, he's standing there and God is something small. He's going to comprehend God. And God is absolute and eternal. God, because he's God, is incomprehensible. He's eternal. He's everywhere. He's everlasting. I was talking this morning about the attributes of God, and there are some of them. Omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, immutability, holiness, glory, and they all add up to this incomprehensibility. And yet man, do you see, says his main problem is intellectual. Where is there a mind, where can there ever be a mind that is big enough to approach God? Have you ever tried reading certain textbooks of philosophy? If you have, you found them very difficult. I find them difficult at any rate. That's the mind of men. Well, go on and multiply by infinity. Try to understand God. How foolishly we talk. Intellectual difficulties. My dear friend, if you had some dim, vague notion of God, you'd put your hand upon your mouth, you'd be silent, and you'd stop talking about your intellect. It cannot be that. There is no mind that can ever arrive at God. You might as well give up before going any further. But let me give you some other reasons. Here, to me, is a reason that is enough in and of itself to show that this cannot be an intellectual matter, uh, namely the very fact that we are so unequal in our position of intellect. We are all human beings, aren't we? Very well, if this question of knowing God and of knowing salvation and of com coming to an understanding of the problems of men and of life and of living in this world, if it were a matter of intellect, Oh, I say it would be very unfair. The men with great intellect would have a great advantage over the men with a lesser intellect, and he'd have an advantage over the men who scarcely has any intellect at all. There are all these inequalities from top to bottom, so that if intellect is the main thing... I was going to say something that perhaps I shouldn't say. And that was that there would obviously be no hope at all for the vast majority of people. 
at any rate judged by the picture you get of them in the newspapers. But thank God it isn't a matter of intellect. And it can't be. It would be unjust. It would be inequitable. Another reason, it seems to me, is this one. I've already just hinted at it. Modern men tells us that he can't be a Christian because of his intellect. He gives the impression that he's governed and controlled by intellect alone. He's just a great reasoning machine. But is he? Well, look at his life, look at his conduct, look at his, look at his behavior. How can anybody in his senses claim that man today is being governed by intellect? Never perhaps has it been more obvious that man is governed by lust and desire and passion and by these elemental drives, as they like to call them today, that are in our human nature, this animal nature, this body, the greatest intellects are driven by them quite as much as the smaller intellects and those who have no intellect apparently at all. These are the things that govern men. Do men sit down with this intellectual calm and consider and discuss and weigh and Of course they don't. Man, by his very life and by his very living and activity, denies his own contention with regard to his attitude towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you still another. Take the case of any convert that has ever taken place in the long history of the church. Doesn't that again prove it in and of itself sufficiently? Take a man who once upon a time was not a believer, not a Christian. He didn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He rejected his gospel. And then I show you the same man, a Christian, converted, rejoicing in it, preaching it. And he still got the same intellect. Still got the same mind. Ah, but you say, he's gone soft. Can you prove to me that he's gone soft? Analyze his life. Has he developed a complex suddenly? Well, is he psychopathic? Well, go and analyze him. Bring your great experts on these matters. Can they pronounce this man to be a psychopath? Of course they can't. They've got to admit and to agree that the man is living a saner and a more balanced and a better life now than he was before. The same man with all the same abilities, rejected, now believes. You see, it can't be a matter of intellect. Or perhaps I can put it finally to you like this under this heading. If the modern men could prove to me that every Christian has no intellect at all, then I'd grant his case. But he can't, of course. You see, if he's right, any man who's a Christian is a Christian because he's lacking in intellect. But the moment I put it to you like that, I know that you with whom I'm reasoning and arguing tonight are fair-minded enough to grant me that you know that that is not the case. Indeed, it is the opposite that some of the greatest intellects and minds that the world has ever known have been Christians and have been outstanding Christians. Very well, then, I say, is it not clear that this first assumption of men today, as it was his first assumption of old in the days when our Lord was here in the flesh, is totally and completely wrong? This is not primarily a matter of intellect. That's his first error. Let me hurry to his second error. As men feels that it is thus primarily a matter of intellect, so in the second place, he feels that what he needs above everything else is more light in terms of more knowledge and more information. Now, I'm not being unfair, am I? Isn't this the typical attitude of the modern men? Now, he says... There's something wrong with the world. There's something wrong with men. Uh, we've been trying to solve it. Civilization has tried to solve it. Your religions have tried to solve it. Still it isn't solved. What's the matter then? Well, what we need is more light. We need more information. Now, let me show you how they say that. Intelligent men describe themselves as seekers and searchers 
after the truth. And uh, they tell us that they spend their time in reading and studying books, studying the social problem, studying the industrial, studying the political problem, studying philosophy. What are they doing? Well, they're disturbed and they're unhappy. And they're seeking and searching for truth, for light, for knowledge, and for information. That's their whole case. They've got the mind. What's lacking? Well, the data, the knowledge, the light. And so they're trying to find it. And they'll read any book that gives them any hope. They'll listen to any lecture. They go after the cults. They're rushing in every direction, seeking for light. Some of them even put it like this. They say, you know, this is a matter of development. The trouble with men, they say individually, and the trouble with the whole world is this is that man is in an evolutionary state and stage. He's just come out of the animal condition, and yet, you see, he hasn't arrived at full manhood and at perfection, but he's moving, he is developing. Knowledge grows from age to age. Every century is an advance on the previous one, and we are going on, and science is making grand and great discoveries, and if it only goes on and on, eventually man will arrive at that great truth that he's seeking for, and when he has that, all his problems will be solved. Be patient, they say. The explorers have set out, they've gone in their ship, they've crossed the known oceans, they're beginning to try to map the uncharted oceans. There is an island somewhere where truth grows perennially, and the great adventurers have set out in the quest. Encourage them, follow them, hold on to them. Man will arrive eventually at this ultimate knowledge. He is advancing. But so far we haven't arrived and we haven't got the knowledge and we are still lacking in the information. And so he tells us, you see, in the second place, that this is really the reason for his troubles. He needs light. He's looking for light. He's waiting for light. Alas, says the Son of God. This is the condemnation. That the light has come into the world and men are still looking for it. The light has dawned and men are still seeking it. The Jew is looking for the Messiah. The Messiah stands before him and he says, away with him, crucify him. A great religious teacher like Nicodemus says, I'm longing for the Messiah. I've been watching you the last few days in Jerusalem. I've seen your miracles. I've been wondering to myself, is this the Messiah? So I've come and I've sought my interview with you. And I want to come and put my questions to you. And then our Lord talks about being born again. Ah, says Nicodemus, I'm wrong after all. This isn't the Messiah. This is rubbish and nonsense, this rebirth of men going back into his mother's womb and being born again. Sheer impossibility. No, no, what is this? I'm looking for it still. So our Lord says quietly to him, this is the verdict. This is the judgment that you, Nicodemus, and people like you are looking still for the light because you don't see it and recognize it and know it when it's shining into your eyes and shining into your face. It isn't more knowledge and light you need. It's come. And that, I say again, is as true this evening as it was when our Lord first uttered it to Nicodemus. Let me demonstrate this again to you. Why is the trouble not that of a need of more light and of more knowledge and of information? Well, let me tell you. There is nothing in a sense which is quite so idiotic when you're talking about these matters as to talk about the scientific age. What has the scientific age got to do with these things? Now, I am not merely saying that. You will find great scientists saying that. I read a statement by Professor Andred the other day in which he said it. He said the business of science is to be concerned about things that can be seen and measured and assessed and experimented with. That's the realm of science. 
Are we concerned about such things this evening? Does God come into that category? Does the soul of men come into that category? Does life itself come into that category? Does love come into that category? Does the emotion a man feels in reading a great bit of poetry, does that come into this scientific... What's the scientific age got to do with all this? Of course there's been a phenomenal advance in the scientific realm. Thank God for it. The gospel is not here to denounce such things. All I'm saying is that they have nothing to do with this. All those are developments and advances in the realm of the seen and the material and the external. Here we are dealing with the unseen and the eternal. God, man, the soul, life, morality, purity, chastity, love, joy, peace, life, death. What lies beyond death? And your scientist is as helpless and as hopeless there as he is when he comes to anything that is outside that strictly limited realm in which he works and operates, where you can touch and weigh and measure and feel. Oh, the tragedy of confusing these things. Can a man by searching find out God? Of course he can't. Let the great scientists go on with their experiments. They'll never find God. What a confusion of terms and of language. Or I can put it in this form to you. While there have been tremendous developments in the realm of scientific knowledge during the nearly 2,000 years that have elapsed since the Son of God was talking to Nicodemus, there hasn't been the slightest fraction of advance or development in knowledge on these very matters which our Lord was discussing with Nicodemus. Tell me, what does the modern man know about God that they didn't know 2,000 years ago? Yeah, more. Answer this. What does the scientific man know about himself over and above what man knew 2,000 years ago? What's the answer? Let me put it very directly and personally. Do you know yourself? Do you understand yourself? It's because we don't, you see, that we often go back to the Psalms and we find the old psalmist there describing our exact feelings and sensations. He fell into sin and he said, Oh, what a fool I was! Why did I do it? You did the same yesterday, if not today. There has been no advance whatsoever in the knowledge of God or of men or of life or of death or eternity or morality and chest. Has there been an advance in the knowledge of morality? In the name of God, I ask you, if there has been, why is your world as it is this evening? If we are morally developing and advancing, why are the newspapers as they are with their filth and their mire? Isn't it painfully obvious that this country, without going any further, is not as moral today as it was a hundred years ago? There is no advance in these matters. But in any case, I could put it to you like this. If this argument is correct, and it's a question of developing and advancing and of getting more light and more knowledge, well, then I say you and I today are doomed. We are in a state of disaster. How does it help you to be told that in a further millennia of years that men will have arrived at perfection and the world would be perfect? It's got nothing to give you. It leaves you in a state of complete hopelessness. The whole thing, we are told, is absolutely hopeless for us. We can but hope that sometime or another in billions and billions of years, men will have arrived at the knowledge what complete despair that is. And in any case, you see, 
It makes the whole thing so utterly relative. And at this point, it's not only pathetic, it almost becomes amusing. Sixty and seventy years ago, people were saying, now as the result of latest knowledge, we are able to say this. And they were dogmatic and certain. The assured results of knowledge. By today, they tell us that all that was quite wrong. Now, this isn't theory, this is fact. There are critics of the Bible who will tell you something like that. I heard it on a discussion on the wireless in the third program, I think it was. One of them said, you know, yes, 60 or 70 years ago, we have to admit the critics went too far. They said then that miracles were impossible. He said, we don't say that now, and we don't say it now because we've got a new view of physics. They'd got that old materialistic notion of physics. Everything was fixed and set. The atom was indivisible. We know the atom is full of life and of energy. Anything's possible. So the dogmatism of 70 years ago was wrong. Yes, but perhaps the dogmatism of today is wrong. In 70 years' time, they'll be saying that the modern critic is wrong. And where are you? I know nothing. Everything is shifting and relative. I'm hopeless. I know nothing. I might as well sit down and die. Thus, you see, man deludes and fools himself. Ah, but the way in which I should put it is this. Our Lord puts it here once and forever. This is the condemnation. That the light has come. And man doesn't know that it has come. There has been one in this world who has lived the perfect life. He was the embodiment of all the modern man says he looks for and longs for. It's been, it's happened, he can make it possible, and yet man doesn't see it. It isn't the knowledge he needs because the knowledge is there. The light to lighten the Gentiles hath appeared. The day star from on high has already arisen and is shining in the heavens in its full meridian. No, no, it isn't primarily an intellectual problem and man's greatest need is not knowledge. What then is the trouble? I close with just a word. Man's final calamity and tragedy is that he doesn't realize that his troubles are not intellectual. Not a need of light and of knowledge. His troubles are moral. This is the condemnation that though the light has come, men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. It isn't a matter of intellect. It isn't a matter of more knowledge and more light being necessary. It's all happened. Well, what's the trouble? Ah, it's man's moral nature. He loves darkness and he hates the light because his deeds are evil. And here you see we are all one and we are all the same. We are not all one and all the same in intellect. We are not all one and all the same in knowledge. But there's one respect in which we are all one and are all the same. What's that? In our moral condition. And there, there are no divisions and no distinctions. We are all one, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin. Men love darkness, and we all do by nature. Your great intellect, he loves it. And your fool, he loves it. Your educated man, he loves certain things that he shouldn't, and so does the man that's utterly illiterate. You could take a selection of graduates of Oxford and Cambridge 
and a selection of men and women taken, if you like, out of the heart of Central Africa, where there's never been any educational system at all, put them together and make your analysis of them, and you'd be amazed to find that they like roughly the same things, and they do the same things. What is the problem there? It's the problem of immorality. They're governed by sex. So are they are in the other group. They drink too much. So they do here. They do all the same things. More morally, we are one. And morally, we are in this terrible condition here described. Let me just give you my headings this evening, I hope, to elaborate it again on another occasion. The trouble with men, the trouble with the world, says Christ, is this, that his mind is not free. His mind isn't open. The trouble is not that he lacks a mind. The trouble is that the mind is governed. It's blinded. It's prejudiced. Blunted. Governed by darkness. Oh, the folly of thinking that we're free. We are governed by the darkness of this world in its mind, in its heart, in its will, in its behavior. The trouble with us is, I say, that we are depraved, that we love evil and delight in it and will have it. And we reject the light because our deeds are evil. Because we want to protect ourselves, because we want to go on doing the things we like to do. My dear friend, if you are not a Christian in this congregation, you are in that position not because you've got a great mind and a great brain. No, no, it's because you're holding on to something that you like. You're being held in a grip and in a vice. The darkness of this world has encompassed you. And it's because you look at Christ and see something of that holiness and that purity and know that he demands that of you. That you put up your supposed intellectual difficulties and problems to shield the moral rot that is in your own life and in your own nature. This is the condemnation. That light is come into the world, but men love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. My dear friend, had you been fooling yourself, had you until this night been deluding yourself, And saying, I'm a modern man, of course, and I must be scientific always. I must have reason and understanding. I must be satisfied intellectually. And so you've adopted your position. And perhaps you were rather proud of it. We've all been there. God grant that you may see tonight that if you are not a Christian, there's only one reason for it, and that is that you are a slave to the world and the flesh and the devil. And oh, if you've seen it, cry out unto the only one who can deliver you out of it. And if you cry to him and ask him to pardon you and to forgive you for your blindness, for your folly, your pride, your arrogance, Oh, if you confess it all to him and ask him to have mercy upon you and to shine into your mind and heart and soul and will and all you are by his gracious Holy Spirit, he will do it. And you will know that the light has come. You'll begin to bask in it and to walk in its glorious light through this world, even through death. And until you see him face to face and enter upon that endless life, that endless day,
Enter into that realm where there is no need of a moon or a sun or a stars because Christ the Lamb is the light thereof. And you will dwell with him eternally in the light. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.